remember your compassion, O Lord, and your merciful love, for they are from of old. Let not your enemies exalt over us.
Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Jesus said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. reading from the book of Genesis. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring. And so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, 
Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. reading from the letter of Paul to the church at Philippi. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross. I have often told you of them, and I, now I tell you, even with tears, their end is destruction, their God is the belly and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are not set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, 
And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The word of the Lord. Jerusalem, 
the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen that gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. <laughs> Please be seated. I recently saw an ad on Facebook for a program that was guaranteed to find, so for you to find your place on the path to instant success by investing in the stock market. And it said that you could make your fortune through investing, you could beat the market, and the best thing about it was you could do it all without knowing anything about the stock market or working very hard. All you had to do was send in $1,500 for the computer program to help pick the stocks. And because the guy promoting this scheme was so magnanimous, it was marked down to $4.99 for a short period, if you act right now. Doing things the easy way is almost more attractive to us in many ways than we would like to admit. More attractive than working hard at something sometimes. More appealing than delayed gratification. Working hard often does yield results, however, sometimes even with the best of intentions and lots of hard work, our success is not guaranteed. And so the promise of an easier way and sure results catches our attention. In all three readings this morning, we are worried about spirit, or we are um, warned about spiritual get-rich-quick schemes. St. Paul is talking to the church at Philippi about just such a thing. He cautions them not to be seduced by the promises of an easier to, way to live out the Christian life. Paul is always very straightforward about his idea of how to live as a Christian, and it's not an easy way sometimes. And he often warns his followers about those who he refers to as false prophets, people who would lead them astray by taking shortcuts. He warns them about taking the easy way out, and he talks about, and he and he calls them who try to make the short, take the shortcuts enemies of the cross of Christ. Those who allow their minds to be set on earthly things. And he encourages the church at Philippi to stand firm and reminds them that true success lies in our relationship with God. In the Old Testament reading, Abram is challenged to trust God's promise and to understand that God's promise is true, even though sometimes we don't understand the timing of such promises. Abram feels adrift. He has traveled a long way from home at God's direction, yet the promise that God has made to him has not been fulfilled. He has no child, no heir. But God once again asks him to trust, to believe, and then God repeats the promise and formally established is the covenant with Abraham, guaranteeing him that a son will be born to him. And then in the gospel, Jesus speaks about the narrow way. For the need to be disciplined in your faith and to be, and to be faithful to God. He knows that there are some who are following him who are looking for answers that will bring them happiness. He also knows that some who are following him 
are looking for easy answers and quick fixes to life's problems. And Jesus becomes impatient with them and frustrated by their inability to understand what he's saying. Yet, as we see, his impatience and frustration give way to compassion as he weeps over Jerusalem and weeps for the people. All these readings have to do with relationships and faithfulness and trust. They acknowledge the difficulty and challenge of staying faithful to God, especially in the face of anxiety or fear. We all want the security of the connection of a deeper relationship with God. We want the assurance that God's deal for us for a better life will be fulfilled and hopefully at a low price without much work. And if God could throw in a plan with three easy payments, well, that would be all the much better. However, even the most naive of us know that this is not how God works or how the world works. Relationships are not one-sided, especially with God. A relationship implies that both parties are invested in the transaction. But sometimes, in the best of times even, we get distracted and overwhelmed and, and we think that sometimes we have higher priorities than to pay attention to important relationships. Sometimes we're just tired or we think that the other party doesn't really care about us or other obligations of life draw our attention away from where it needs to be. Sometimes it's easier just to let ourselves get distracted than to do the things that keep a relationship going. Anybody who is married or is in a committed relationship knows how true this is. We know that some days it is easier to believe that that other person can carry the load today and we don't have to worry about our part and we assume that they're, they will always be there no matter what we do. We know that in a committed relationship like marriage, the scales don't always even up. And we also know in a committed relationship like a marriage that when the scales come out, there is trouble in River City. Because that relationship is not a contract. It's not a contract where the scales balance, where we have equal goods or services for equal consideration. A covenant is the agreement that I will do the best that I can for you as often as I can. In exchange, you do the best for me as often as I can, knowing very well that scales sometimes will totally be out of whack. We also live in a society that teaches us that all resources, including love, are finite. And that if our neighbor finds a greater degree of success or happiness than we do, then there is less of it for us. And so we stockpile our love. We stockpile our charitability. We hoard it. We live in fear of being vulnerable and getting hurt because somebody has more than we do. And as important as it is, we sometimes find it easier just to simply bypass the hard work of love. We risk taking the easy way, risking the success of a relationship, even when we know that there is nothing that we need more of than that depth and that richness of being in a true relationship with each other, with our families, our friends, our loved ones, and ultimately with God. We cheat ourselves when we take the easy way, when we avoid the narrow way of truth and integrity and love, and when we try to live without them in our relationships with each other and with God, that relationship crumbles. And it is then that somebody like St. Paul reminds us to repent and to restore that relationship, to be reconciled. And Jesus reminds us that he weeps for Jerusalem and he weeps for us when our relationship with God wanes. The narrow way is about loving unconditionally and giving unconditionally. It's about opening our hearts to God and to one another. It's about taking chances and being vulnerable 
even though it's risky. It's risky because failure hurts. Sometimes our hearts get stepped on or broken when we make ourselves open and vulnerable. Yet that is what Jesus is calling us to do. And therein lies the great paradox of Christianity. True love involves taking risks and being vulnerable. And sometimes it doesn't work. And it hurts. But Jesus tells us that we need to love each other and to love God even when we don't think it's working out. Jesus urges us to keep going regardless of the possibility of failure. Jesus reminds us always to err on the side of love. Some Pharisees came to Jesus and he said, you can get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said to them, go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will finish my work. Jesus was telling them, I know what Herod has in store for me. I know where this whole thing is leading. I know that my fate will be painful, but in spite of that, I will press on. Despite all that, I will err on the side of love. And despite all that, I will give you an example of what you must do. And that is the great paradox of Christianity. Love unconditionally, even if it kills you. In the dining room of her convent in Calcutta, Mother Teresa had a poem entitled Anyway, painted on the wall. And it's often attributed to her, but it was actually written in 1968 by a young 19-year-old student at Harvard named Kent Keith. And the poem is often called The Paradoxical Commandments. And I think it's a very elegant summation of what the Christian life is all about. It goes like this. People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of being selfish or having ulterior, ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People who really need help, who need your help, may attack you if you help them. Help people anyway. Give the world the best that you have, and you may get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you've got anyway. Ultimately, that is what God asks of us, to give the world our best. Lent is a time when we are asked by the church to reflect on what our best looks like and how we sometimes fall short of doing our best. So this week, as we go out into the world, let's think about what it looks like to do our best. When we love unconditionally, when we strive to create new relationships and strengthen old ones, when we reach out to those in need and when we look deep into ourselves and sometimes don't like what we see. And as we do that, let us remember that no matter how great our success or how great our failure, God loves us anyway. And God calls us to do the same. God calls us to go out into the world with love and compassion and vulnerability and we may succeed 
or we may fail. But regardless, God calls us through our baptism to go out into the world and do it anyway. Let us stand and profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found on page six in the worship bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge, to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue to pray this week for the church around the world, for our diocese and for the Anglican Communion, for Jeffrey, our bishop, for our standing committee, and for the staff at Nicholson House. We continue to pray for the mission and ministry of All Saints Cathedral, for our companion diocese of Nuala in Tanzania, and for the people of Holy Trinity Church in Prayer de Sheen. We remember the people of our covenant partner, the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist and their rector, Bishop Jeff Haynes. We pray for all seeking God's healing grace, including those on our prayer list, Polly, David, Tori, Dasani, Tracy and Andrew, Gunnar, Michael, Jim, Mary, Bob, Rosario, Todd, Betty, Carol, Covey, Pat and Eloise, Whitney, Sean, Lila and Tom, Dan, Dennis, the twins, Maggie, Mark, Cassandra, Evelyn, Logan, Dan and Gabe. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for those celebrating life milestones this week. We pray for all celebrating birthdays this week, including Carol Ketter, Lee Klugowitz, and Jack Kalman and we pray for all couples celebrating anniversaries this week. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacrament. We pray for all who govern and uphold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion, compassion on those who suffer 
from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departer who departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We pray, praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others, for the people of the Ukraine. We pray for all those who will die this day, suddenly and unprepared. We pray for the perpetrators of violence. We pray in the words of the Archbishop of Canterbury, God of peace and justice. We pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear that you would hold them and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. And God's peace be with you all. And also with you. Good morning. Please be seated. Welcome to All Saints. Only one announcement today which is remember that next week is the annual meeting and there will be one service at 9.30 with the meeting to follow. Now I know that some people find excuses not to come to the annual meeting. I would say don't do that. <laughs> it's a serious abrogation of your responsibility as a member of this congregation. And we have many weighty things to talk about this year including some thoughts on whether at the end of the next two years we might not even be a cathedral. So come to the meeting. Come hear what people have to say. Come for fellowship and prayer. But come. 9.30, next Sunday, one service with the meeting to follow. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. And also a reminder that in the Episcopal Church, all baptized Christians are welcome to receive Holy Communion.
Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. 
All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down before the Lord. Keep this your family, Lord, with your never-failing mercy that relying solely on the help of your heavenly grace, they may be upheld by your divine protection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. It's not. 